go. Hey everybody, cool. yeah. so I and Scott Lease with Martin Roth, who is he's the first guy to like try and take over the show before we even introduce him. <laughs> Martin, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I'm glad to be here. Um, well, I, what we were saying right before uh, this all kicked off was that um, I really like what y'all are doing with um, just with the, how prolific this Surf and Sales podcast is. Because <laughs> so like, I'm laughing because somebody is crawling <laughs> in the background. My wife is climbing in the background. That's just fantastic. come say hi. Just come say hi. <laughs> just Kelsey, come here. Just come say hi. No. <laughs> just come wave in the. <laughs> That was I awesome. See. Just say hi. Okay. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're uh we're in we're in it's because quarantine times are weird. Um we we've been stuck. We're we live in New Orleans and we've been stuck in our house for six weeks like everybody else. So we have uh her, her family has a place in Pensacola, Florida, which is only three hours away from New Orleans. So we came here and I locked myself in a room to do this podcast interview and then she is army. I guess she needs something from the room. So pardon the interruption. Sorry, everyone. Um. <laughs> But what I was saying is you guys are prolific. I was looking back through the topics that y'all have covered and it's, uh, you know, they're obviously all wrapped to the person that you're, you're interviewing. So it's, you know, Colin Cadmus is talking about stuff that's relevant for his organization. Or you had like Andy Raskin on, which is like, that's a, that's a baller interview. Um, I've been a fan of that guy for a long time. So you're hitting the right people. You're doing a lot of content, which is really important. Uh, and that's something that it, the, any any success that we've had at Level Set is definitely because we've just been prolific at producing content, uh, and that drives most of our inbound. So, um, are, you, are you? I don't know. I don't, you how do you? How do you? How do we kick the, these things off? Yeah, what, I've, what I've we, got a question what for what you already. About? <laughs> like, so are you guys producing more content now? Or are you like doubling down on on content mm -hmm. creation and maybe you know experimenting with like different modalities and ways to deliver content? um getting getting creative on, on on some level and and maybe just for context like you're the you're the vp of sales for level set so maybe tell everybody you know what what it is you guys do and what industry you're in and what the sales like just so the audience has some context there but i'd, I'd love to hear more about your kind of content creation strategy and and what you're doing and experimenting with right now to drive leads and business for yourself and one correction he's yeah he's the, sure so He's also a VP of revenue, which oh, me sorry. Is yeah. but it, but it's, it makes oh, me good. think differently than VP of sales. Right. So I, I am curious as to how that also fits because revenue often implies customer success and sales and other yeah. things. So that would be cool to understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll touch, there's, there's two, two points there. I'll take the first one cause that's a little easier and I'll, I guess, introduce my background. So um, VP of revenue at level set, uh, my umbrella of responsibility is anything that touches the revenue side of the org. So obviously sales, um, business development, um, the ex expansion revenue, um, our transactional revenue, which is a component of our business that isn't common in, in traditional SaaS, but we have a transactional component of our business that rolls up to me. Um, and over the years, um, different disciplines have kind of ebbed and flowed in and out of revenue as we've scaled. Um, so my background, I, I started at Level Set almost eight years ago. Um, I was the first sales hire. I was one of the first five employees. My background prior to that, I was an entrepreneur. I uh, founded a company, raised a little bit of money. It did not um, take off, obviously, which is how I found myself at Level Set. At the time, we used to be called VLean. That was the company. Um, what we do is we help contractors get paid faster on their jobs. So construction contractors, not just like remote work contractors. We help the construction industry get paid faster on their jobs by helping them navigate a, a really um, complex and cumbersome payment process. Um, what that means is that in most states or in every state, there's these things called liens. You've heard of a lien, like a tax lien or a, um, a, real, a real estate lien in construction. The lien is your security instrument to make sure that you can get paid on a job. Everyone in construction cares about the lien right because there's a lot of risk in in, um, in non-payment and when people don't get paid and they do file a lien, what happens is um, the person who holds the lien can foreclose on the property, which is a very serious thing in construction. So everybody from the construction lender all the way through to the person who supplied the lumber for the construction project 
has a high degree of interest in who has lien rights and who doesn't and how it all gets protected. Now, the problem is that every state has different rules, kind of like sales tax. Every state has different laws for lien rights, which going back to your question, Scott, um, that gives us a content opportunity because that's like 50 different content um, silos that we can write into right. that are very, right. very rich. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And, yeah, and, 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 and we think about content, you, when you're asking are you about hammering are we, are all those right now? more. Wait, what's that? Are, are you hammering all these different channels right now and doing, do, or doing anything different or just kind of doubling down on what was working before? Yeah, so, um, so that's, that was the, the other part of your question. So, so well, um, you were asking, like, are, are we doubling down on content right now? The answer is absolutely. So when we look at our marketing organization, um, over the uh, I, marketing used to be in my umbrella of influence. Now we're at a scale where we have a marketing org. We have a, 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 um, a head of market, a chief marketing officer. We have a content team. We have a growth team. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot more mature, like nine or 10 people that are on that team that are split across um, three different types of content. So we obviously have organic content that we're generating. Uh, so organic content is blog posts, videos, things that we're publishing are either just like COVID related. Uh, as an example, one of the big questions recently has been, is construction essential business, right? That's getting a lot of search. That's ephemeral, though. That search traffic is really only going to be um, happening for, you know, it started about three weeks ago, three to four weeks ago, and it's just kind of slowly tapered off. So we had, a, we, we captured a lot of content around there. And if you go search, is construction essential business? My guess is we're probably going to be in one of the first three search results if we're not the first search result. Um, so we've been doing a lot of, of opportunistic content creation. Um, but in addition to that, we've also, we have our core content, which is just like, like we've always done, just best practice around managing lien rights. Um, if there's any case law that comes out or cases that get decided that can shift the interpretation of the law, we're publishing on that stuff. Um, the good news is that the search has been consistent about construction payment and lien rights for a long time and will be for a long time. And the economy right now, if anything, is just increasing people's interest in this topic because we help people get paid faster and that's like really really important to everyone right now cool the nice. other two the other two content verticals we have um that may be a little bit different we have um we, we have some network effects with our product so if you think about a construction job you have um you have like the lumber lumber supplier for example and then you have the contractor who bought the lumber and is installing it at the property and then you have the owner. So those are three different participants on that construction job. Every one of those participants has a value to get from level set and is a potential customer. So when a customer uses us, they're using us to exchange documents and exchange information with other nodes on the construction job. And we pull those people into the product and those people generate more content that gets published externally and that's searchable. Uh, and then the third is we have, we launched this expert center, which is a network of construction attorneys and, and construction finance experts. And people can post questions like Quora. They can post questions and get answers. And those are non-level set employees that are answering and that's generating search. So we have like this Quora thing here. We've got like a WebMD version of construction lien rights. That's all of our organic content that we're publishing. Um, and then you got these network effects that are um, kind of like Glassdoor, how people can review each the, the work that they do with each other and that's searchable. All three of those things are driving our, our, um, our content. And we're definitely, we're like double, triple, quadrupling down on that because that's our, we want to own, our strategy is to own, own the demand. And if we can own the demand, then we know that we can own um, the conversion of that demand. So how do you... Do you see, and those are great, like I, those super tactical, right? I'm, I'm sitting here going, oh, I could do that in my business, right? I'm sure Scott could too. Mm -hmm. um, it goes back to, to the guild, right, Scott? Um, <laughs> but do you see them changing? Like you said, organic is still there, which I'm seeing too, is like people have more time to do some research right now, right? So there's much more top of the funnel ABM stuff happening right now, in my opinion. But do you see the other two 
do you see any of those doing more or less or are still the same or something skyrocketed that you weren't expecting? So where we're seeing the most growth with organic, or um, I'm just going to say traffic because it's technically it is organic traffic in the in the sense that it's it's happening or it's not paid, right? So it's not it's it's earned, not bought. Um, but when we but it's not organic in that we're producing the content that drives the, the traffic. The users of our platform are producing the content that drives the traffic, right? So we have seen. I mean, it's a, a there's a there's a viral component to that. I mean, it's not viral viral like Facebook is viral, but there's a little bit of a viral coefficient, and it's a flywheel like anything else. We keep chipping away at it. It's spinning faster. We the KPIs that we look at are you know how many questions get asked, how many answers get provided. From those interactions, it is spitting off leads for our sales team, and our sales team will follow up with those contacts when it's appropriate, when we have their permission, of course. Um, so we definitely are seeing. Uh, more and more traction and and like the lead view that I look at when I just look at our inbound demand week over week or month over month, I can see the portion of our leads that comes from that source just growing and growing and growing. And that's a positive thing because there's no end in sight. I mean, it's, it's, it, uh, yeah, this is a, this, it has a network a, effect. The new norm. It's the new norm right now. There is no end yeah. in sight. Just, this is the lay of the land and you gotta, you gotta make it happen. I, I have a question for you. Um, how big is the sales organization right now? Or, or maybe rephrase, like how many people are, are directly or indirectly reporting up to you on the, on the revenue team? Yeah, sure. So we have 30 frontline reps. Um, that team is well, 32 to be specific. We have four reps on a transactional team. And that transactional team is literally following up on people to help them file a document. Um, so somebody will come to us and, and order a lien or a notice or something. So we have four people who are helping those transactional customers complete their order. Um, the good news about that portion of our business is that serves, um, oh, it produces free account users, uh, which we can upsell into subscription accounts. Um, so then I have a, an upgrade team that has nine people on it. It's an SMB team, but they specifically focus on upselling free account users into subscription. Yeah. So you've um, got it. 15 You've got it specialized pretty, pretty distinctly then. Yeah. So do we have, yeah. And then we have 15 on the SMB team. Those are just full desk AEs that are taking inbound content. We have our network contacts, which are, are some of the uh, outbound that we do and they're pulling those through a sales cycle. And then I have four on our mid market team um, that's focused on when you're, target <laughs> when, you're when you step into this head of revenue kind of role, um, I think this is a question that's relevant to anybody in a leadership role right now. Like, how, how are you prioritizing? Um, how are you prioritizing your your revenue gains? Like, are are you more focused on new logos and new clients right now, or are you more focused on um, you know expansion revenue? Um, what what? How do you decide at what point which one to focus on, or are you just pushing all in? on all things all at once. I think that that's a challenge for people when they when they step into the role, right? Of, of knowing which which side of the house to kind of prioritize. Um, so, so I'm curious mm -hmm. how you think about that. Not not even just in the context of, of where you're at right now, but just as, as a leader. I mean, even if you went to another organization right now, you know, you show up to scott.com and, and there's, you know, people selling in different products at different parts of the sales cycle. Like, how do you know where to, where to begin and, and where to where to push first? Yeah, that's a great question. I want to finish answering the first question before I move on to answering that one because I think it'll provide good context. Um, so we have the 32 frontline reps that are specialized. All of them are focused on new logo and new ARR acquisition, right? Um, on top of that team, I've got six frontline managers. I've got two people on sales operations or one sales ops and one revenue ops who kind of owns rev ops. And then on our CS side, we do have a VP of customer experience. The CS org rolls up to her, um, but there's a, a dotted line to our account management team. That account management team is in our weekly forecast meeting. That account management team is in our pipeline review every week as a, as like a revenue leadership team. So I consider the AM team, which is exclusively focused on expansion revenue as opposed to, acquisition revenue that team does roll up to me um and so we have a lot of influence over how that team the plays that they're running 
the how they're ramping up new reps, all that stuff. So the to answer your second question, Scott, how do I prioritize? Well, you know, I think any any leader is going to say like you need you need to make sure you have to, you have the the right frontline management in place and that you've got clear priorities set. Um, and we have both both are important. New logo acquisition, I'd say, is king. Uh, new 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 revenue acquisition from new logos is king. Um, but expansion revenue is something that's becoming more of a focus for us. Um, it, this year, it's been it's been more prioritized than it has been in years past. Um, so that's a shift that we're seeing. And I think what happens is, I know that you you've seen this. Um, it, certainly, Scott, in the company, in the in the teams that you've run, once your installed base of customers gets to a certain size of, of ARR and a certain number of customers, the expansion revenue that you can get in a given period, a month or a quarter, becomes really significant. Um, and at some point, it starts to near near the amount that you're getting in new revenue acquisition, unless your churn's just going out of control. And I think about halfway through last year, we recognized that our our AM team had the ability with some discipline to really make a difference with expansion revenue to combat some of the churn that we have. Um, so it's the, anybody that says you have two masters it means that you have no masters. Um, so I am going to force rank them new revenue and new logo acquisition is king. We do like growth, but we do see expansion as a way to combat churn um, and, and a way to, um, and a way to accelerate our, our revenue growth. And Richard, I'm sorry, you asked a question early on about our customer and the sales cycle and the deal size. So I'll speak to that briefly. Um, it's a it's a short sales cycle. Um, on the on the subscription side, our average contract value or ACV is around four thousand a year, and that's an ARR number. And the sales cycle is four days. Wow, that's awesome. So that's pretty pretty cool. What, so, you know, it's interesting because you brought up another term, well, two terms. What's the difference between revenue ops and sales ops? That's a great question. When we think about revenue operations, it spans across three things. We have our growth team and the growth team is driving engagement within the, within the platform, within our product and finding ways to pull our network into sales conversation, CRM is a source of truth, making sure that Salesforce and the other tools in our stack are working to support the growth team, working to support the CS team, and working to support the sales team. Each of those three different teams have different needs from our tech stack and from our operations. And so I look at revenue operations as an umbrella across all three. Sales ops specifically looks at what the sales team is working on. Is there a different makeup between someone who runs sales ops versus revenue ops or can they be? Uh, I mean, our sales ops person reports to the, it's a director of revenue ops and, and the sales ops person just reports to the revenue ops person. Same, see, we have a CS ops person who reports to that revenue ops person. Um, the makeup, I guess it'd be more, more strategic in, in, in how they think about their business um, can, has the dynamic range to think tactically and to think uh, strategically about about the business. How are you, I'll turn the light on real quick. It's getting dark in here. How are you thinking about um, training right now, right? In, in, in the sense of on onboarding and, and things like that. Like, what do you, what are your plans? You know, if you get tasked with, you know, needing to grow the sales team or needing to grow the, you know, account management team or the expansion team and that type of thing, like. I, I, I think that this is one of the reasons why companies are on a little bit of a, you know, a hiring freeze, even the ones that are doing really well. I think that they're not sure how to train people remotely. Have you guys thought about that and put any time and energy into, into that yet? Yeah, absolutely. So we, so we raised a $30 million round in, in November of last year. Uh, and we raised that money to, to grow. <laughs> we didn't, uh, we, we definitely, um, we see a big market ahead of us and we have a lot of appetite to grow into that market. And so over the last, you know, we've been, in, we've been in expansion over the last year. Um, we, what we did, and I'll, I'll tell you how I think about training and I'll, and I can talk to some of the successes. 
of, of what we saw. Um, when we, when we, when we raised the money, we launched this thing called the sales Academy, a level set sales Academy. Um, and what I, you know, you build your hiring profile and we knew what, what we, uh, what we were looking for and what successful reps looked like and what the, the pattern was. Um, but we were hiring in classes of 14, uh, so we're, I'd say like 12 to 15 was the size of the class, but um, it just so happened that the three classes that we hired sequentially were, were up 14. Um, and so we were ramping, ramping those teams in. We brought them in at 14. They went through an eight week intensive training program. We had a, a head of enablement who was running each of those training programs. And the, um, and, and, you know, it's like you give them leads, you make sure that they have the right, Script um, and language in, in, in our business, the script is important, but they're not like rote going through the motions of like reading off the paper to sell to the to the prospect. Um, but you have this this eight weeks of of, of pretty intensive in person training, um, and we did a class in November, we did a class in January, and we did a class in March. And I'll give you the time frame. We we brought that class. So you in just, on March so you've 15th. been through this during during COVID and during quarantine. You've already trained people. Yeah, and the problem, um, well, the problem is that we did we did go through across um, our organization. We went through a reduction in force to get burn under control. So that's like Richard, you were talking about the 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 um, thing that would make me squeamish. It doesn't make me squeamish. I mean, it's a, it is a very unfortunate thing to go through. I'm sure both of you have, have had to go on, or maybe you, maybe you have, maybe you haven't had to go through that in your experience. Um, it's a terrible thing to have to, to have to go through a reduction in force. Um, but we did it because we felt that we needed to get our burn under control as we looked at an uncertain market. Um, and we needed to make sure we have enough cash so that when we reapproach the market, we think about it in three phases. We're in like a, the phase, the, there's like a reaction, then there's a lockdown phase, which is what everybody's in. And then we're going to be in the rebound phase. And we don't know if that's going to start four weeks from now or four months from now. I mean, hopefully it's sooner rather than later, but we want to make sure we have as much dry powder to go into that rebounding phase so that we can scale the org. And we've already gone through the, the, um, the hard work of building the sales academy, building the classes, building the curriculum. We've got three turns through it. So we've already improved our processes. And we're like ready to go, ready to hire whenever we're whenever we we want to make that decision, um, and we want to start scaling again. And I'm hopeful that within the next within the next month or two, we'll be at a point where we are ready to start deploy uh, to start deploying capital and, and and scaling up the sales team. And we've already got the the curriculum and the go forward plan for it, the process, so to speak. Yeah, I've, I've actually. Not only have I had to go through that layoff, I actually had to secretly go hire in a whole other state with and lie to my sales team of 40 people. Uh, that, oh, yeah, don't worry, you know, all this stuff. Then when they found out it was happening, I had to lie to them that, nope, you're all going to have your job. I got to be the bad guy. So, um, yeah, yeah I've, I've been say, you know, it's an interesting thing. But, we talked about this a lot of the leadership team is that like, you, I don't know, we, um, that sucks. Like I, I'm just thinking about what that would be like to have to go through that, Richard. And that's like, uh, it you, it forces you into a in, into um, a compromising position, like to to have to to do that with people that you know you're in the in the trenches with. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was brutal. Stuff. We talked. So, but I want to I want to pull us out a little bit. I want to pull us out of the out of the weeds of of what you guys are doing, but you know. Where did where did Martin come from? What was Martin like? Were you the business minded kid who always had an opportunity going? You know, did you sell stuff as a kid? Um, did you? Yeah. You know, like what what was what was what was little Marty like? What did mom and dad what did mom and dad say? So I'm the youngest of seven kids. Um, my parents are are amazing, but also insane. Um, so big family. I don't know if either of you are from a big family, but. In a big family, you have to. No, but um, both of the parents are insane. Yeah, you, I can relate to that. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, we. Uh, so I'm the youngest of seven, um, and in a big family, um, you know, if you want to get noticed, you got to have a big personality. And so, as the youngest, um, I had a lot of autonomy. Uh, both my parents worked, uh, and they they made sure that we all had jobs. I always had a job, um, even before I could drive. I had a job. 
Uh, so I knew how to work. I knew how to put my head what down. Was um, what was your and also, Believe it or not, coming from New Orleans, my first job was cooking crawfish at a seafood market. Doing what? Say it again. I feel like is appropriate. The most cooking New Orleans at a, Yeah, the most New Orleans job ever. I worked That's at a seafood market, Beanie's, and I was 14 years old. I had to get a permit from the principal of the school to like go and, and get an hourly wage at this company. Um, right. So I sold, I sold fish as my first job. So, and did you like selling? Like even at that age, did you like this? I, like do you, what, what lessons do you remember from selling fish that you're still applying? Today? Yeah, now, that, that's probably too far ago and not like the, the right uh, memory to, to think back on about selling. Um, no, like I, I def, I, like a lot of people I had, I had, if I think back to what I thought when I was like 15 or whatever, I had the same apprehension about sales that most people do um, where, you know, they think it's sleazy or that you know, whatever lies people tell themselves about what sales is. And then in college, um, I, I was, a, I was an industrious kid. Like I always had a job. I was always, you know, hawking something like I always had like a little hustle going on. Um, and then I, I got oh, teamed up with, there's a guy who started a, Come on, slow down. Like I, I can tell you're the youngest of seven because you don't stop to let anybody else say anything. <laughs> You've been conditioned that way. <laughs> what was just a, just from a creative point of view? You know, what were you hustling in college? Was it legal or illegal? Scott, Scott's is questionable. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, mine's questionable. I told the line quite well. Um, no, it was it was all legal. So we had a little we had a textbook uh, uh, resell business where I was like buying textbooks and, and reselling them for a little markup. Um, that was like the easy, simple one. What else were we doing? Um, we, I mean, I got into like building websites for, for people. That was, that was like building simple WordPress websites. Um, when a lot of like small businesses didn't have websites, um, it definitely got into that. And then my, my sophomore year, um, I, I met this guy, Kyle Berner. He, he's the founder of a, a flip-flop company. It's called Feel Good. Well, now they do all kinds of apparel. Um, but if you go to Whole Foods and they sell flip flops in the in like the whole body section, those flip flops they're called Feel Good. That company started in New Orleans, and so I was employee number one at that company, and I was 19. Um, and so I helped him. And we we I helped him sell into Whole Foods, and we went from like literally no revenue to being in over 300 stores nationwide. Uh, I didn't go to class very much because um, I was on the road selling flip flops. So that was my, that was my initiation to like the real business world. That wasn't me just hawking textbooks or building yeah. WordPress sites for people your, to try to make extra your, money. What, what was one of your, if you're allowed to talk about it, what kind of mistakes did you make at that early stage? You're college minded, you're having success, but you know, to a certain extent, you don't know what business success and failures look like. You don't know what, what yeah, good yeah. And, and maybe you did because you know, you were always doing this growing up at a young age. But like, everyone was like, God, oh, Richard, you know, there was this one time we were trying to do this and we totally blew it. We totally missed this. And I've learned not to do that kind of stuff again. Bear your soul. Um, Come on. Go deep. Well, I'll, I'd rather talk about rather than feel good. So while I was still in school, I started, I started my business, Gifmeo, and we raised money and we hired a developer. And we worked on that business for like three years and it ended up going nowhere and I lost $380,000. And I have a lot more war stories to tell about that one than I do tell about, that's, about the, the, that's great. the deal. So people who are listening, right? So people who are listening, you went out and got 380, whether it was friends and family or a VC, but what were the mistakes you look back on that and go, gosh, you know, here's what I learned. Here's my lesson. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing was I, my, um, my partner, like I, my 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 uh, business partner, the co-founder with me was non-technical, and I was non-technical. Um, and so, you know, the first thing was like, if you're going to found something that is a technical product, make sure you have a technical co-founder. Uh, the second thing was that we we went and found, um, we basically found someone to build the the technology for us, uh, and scoping that out and the accountability that we had on that person to build the right thing was very, very little, if any at all. And so we didn't have the right control set up to make sure that what we were paying for was actually being built. That was failure number two. Number three, the idea was not validated in hindsight. I mean, we had a lot of conviction about the validity of the idea, but 
in the whole like lean startup world that we're in now where you can go out and you can validate an idea you can get paying customers we didn't do any of that stuff and that was a mistake we we should have um we should have been a lot more more lean uh in, in validating what what business model we were going after um, martin what did you so talk uh, there's a I, I hear this all the time about lean where were you not lean where were you well, not we were, okay I, but the best the best example we hired a PR firm. I think we were spending, and this was on the advice of one of our investors. I can't, I can't remember exactly the details, but we hired this PR firm for on like a $10,000 a month retainer. And I cringe when I think of this story because like I wouldn't even hire a, a PR firm. Yeah, right I'm, now I'm, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, retainer. has any PR you know, firm oh ever delivered a positive ROI? <laughs> and they were, and they were going to like, they were going to coordinate our launch and they were going to do all this stuff. And like, it was, I mean, we, 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 burned through like 40 grand with this company and had nothing to show for it. And I, in hindsight, like if I could go back and find myself, I'd be like, what are you doing? Like, do, this is not, this is not how you spend money. This is not how, this isn't how you execute in the business. Um, so, so that's a, that's a perfect example of not being lean. And I think that because of those scars being at level set um, or what was then Z lean, I mean, we were cash flow positive for the first, um, three three plus years you know we went from i joined they had a, they were post revenue so they had a um our founder started the business made a couple hundred thousand in, in revenue but no arr it was all transactional and we we got to two and a half million in arr before we took a dollar of, of institutional capital and so i knew how to bootstrap i knew how to be scrappy and i was so gun shy to spend money on on unnecessary things because of my experience with my own business I think that served us well and still serves me well. I'm very skeptical to spend money, um, even though we, we have, you know, we have good capital partners and we have a strong balance sheet right now. I'm still apprehensive to go spend um, unnecessarily. And that's is that probably, that's a good thousand dollars or is that how you're wired? Um, well, if I could tell you about my personal life, I'm not wired that way because I can spend money like nobody's business on my, per <laughs> my personal life. But as it relates to how I run my PNL, I'm very, very um, uh, frugal. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not really, ha I'm wired to work hard. Um, and, and, and as part of working hard, I definitely make sure that we're spending every dollar wisely. You think, you think you have the sort of serial entrepreneur gene? Like you think that you've got another company or two or three in you at some point in time? Yeah. Absolutely. I think about it almost daily. Yeah. What are some of the, um, it's, what are some of the interesting markets or ideas or, or, you know, changes in, in business landscape that um, are attractive to you? Like, could you see yourself going one particular path over the other because you got passion about it or, or, you know, a really good idea around it? Are you thinking of it to that yeah. level of detail yet? Yeah, I mean, so I'd say, I'd say, uh, well, the first thing is like, I'm, I'm in a really good spot. I, I'm learning a, a tremendous amount where I'm at with level set. We're going to grow. We have just a huge market ahead of us. I'm trying to build this team from, from having 30 reps on it now after everything with COVID, I, you know, I see a, I see a clear path to, for us getting to get into 50 million or more in ARR um, and building the sales team to being a really strong large professional sales org that that has careers for people and so i want to i want to see this through i also trust our ceo and i trust our leadership team um so i i gotta i gotta finish this chapter um but in the next i'm not like itching to jump off the ship i guess is what i'm saying um because you're i am learning safe, a lot you're being but, practical you're just you know you're not trying to upset your boss we get it we know he's not going anywhere whoever your ceo is <laughs> the uh and well, you know, I mean, look, we, we, we speak freely. We speak freely about this stuff. I mean, I'm, I, I came from a company that I founded to not being a founder. And that's, I think, the big thing. Um, look, both of you have had bosses and both of you now work for yourself. There's a big difference in what that feels like when at the end of the day, you can lay your head on your pillow and know that all the equity is yours, good, bad, or indifferent, right? Look, well, that, the only just thing a different. Martin, the only thing we're trying to recruit for you is, is get you and two of your sales reps to come to the next surf and sales as soon as this COVID thing is done. <laughs> That's the only recruitment. Now I know, I know the score. Know 
I know the score. So what I'd say to answer your question, Scott, is what, what do I think is interesting? Um, I don't have like a, a, a business idea, but if I was going to go pursue something, I think there's a lot right now in um, supporting remote teams. And I know that's topical because of everybody is remote, but if, even if you look before, um, I think there's the whole idea around education, training, and technology to support remote teams is is very interesting to me. Um, I, I also like vertical software. Uh, I, you know, we, we built this business in the construction vertical when, and when we started down this road, a, a lot of folks were saying vertical is the wrong way. You need to be horizontal. It's bigger market share. I think that, I think that vertical SaaS is the way to go. I think that SMB is a place that a lot of SaaS companies don't look. And I think that there's a, that, you know, it's like the blue ocean strategy, go to where the competitors aren't. No, everybody drools over super sexy, you know, enterprise and strategic customers. I like John Doe, who doesn't have a website, but is still willing to spend three or $4,000 on a four-day sales cycle. And I think there are a lot of markets that you can go disrupt by focusing on the bottom first and going capturing the long tail and then parlaying that into an enterprise. Um, so the categories like generally, Scott, Scott are like, so I was gonna say, now I know why Scott likes you. He loves those small sales cycles where you can just get in and get out, right? Uh, yeah, and, and then, I don't, you know, I don't, have, the, I don't have the patience for the two-year deal cycle, man. I just don't. Right? <laughs> it's important. It's important yeah. to be. It's important to know yourself and and not put yourself in a situation where you, you know, might you have a, a chance to fail. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I love deals of all sizes, and I'm involved in our enterprise deals now. We've got we got an eight hundred thousand dollar AR deal that's on ropes. I like those, um, those, deals, we have too. A I like those deals too. I just don't yeah. want to wait two years for them. That's 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 exactly. I'm I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, I'm gonna build my nine to five on just cycling through yeah. what I can eat right in front of me. Um, and and I think it also creates a better platform for sales reps. So like I know that Scott Scott you and I have had lunch and, and talked about this, but I think that there's an entire generation of sales leaders who are doing a disservice to the reps that they hire and train through because they're venture backed. They have uh, an impetus to grow. They've got to put people in a seat to get a number, they have poor training, they have poor process, they, and I'm taking broad strokes here, but you know, you can, you can think through this stuff. And at times, sometimes, you know, everybody makes mistakes, right? So it's not like every sales leader is perfect, but I think that there's, there's this whole generation of sales reps who are coming into a market that has a ton of available capital and companies are getting funded and putting leaders in place and they're looking at themselves and, you know, and, New Orleans doesn't really have these characteristics as a hiring market. We have an office in Austin, Texas. I've got about 50 people in that office. There's 25 of those 50 are on the sales team. And when I look at those 25 folks and what we've had to do to hire and scale in that market, I, and I know that it's the same in San Francisco and in Phoenix and in, in Denver, um, you have a lot of AEs that are like two or three years into their career. And they're like, I'm a mid market or a strategic rep. And it's like, you definitely have the potential to be that and I want to help you get there, but like, you're not quite, you're not quite there yet. And that's um, why I love SMB and why I love the quick sales cycle is I love that you can really, you can really get a bunch of, 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 of up and coming talent that has all the potential and, and they can grow into the rep that they need to be and they can focus on a shorter sales cycle with a simpler sale and and they can they can actually feel like a winner because the sales cycles are short enough and that's really important i think early on in the sales career for anyone uh and so if i had to go build a company that's where i would focus because i think the best the best go to market maybe i'm i'm i don't know like a, I'm, I'm a i'm a i'm from louisiana so i have a simple mind right but maybe the the I believe that the easiest way to go about scaling is you got to pick up the phone and you got to call into the market. And I love product led growth and I'm bought in and I think Slack and zoom and all these companies are doing great stuff. But even if you look at those companies, there's no way around picking up the phone and talking to customers. Uh, and I think that's, and that that's the path in my opinion. I totally agree. And, it, and it's interesting because, you know, even from a lean startup perspective, that's a smart play too, right? You, for a shorter sales cycle, you can find and coach people earlier in their sales career, right? You don't have to go and pay for that, you know, that massive, you know, high, you know, low, high six figure, 150 K base, 
right? For your startup to get your first rep, you can go buy, get three reps right. to, to do that stuff. So I, I love that. Um, for those watching, Scott had to bounce or, and listening, Scott had to bounce. He has a sick son today, so he's going to go take care of him. But, you know, Martin, we always, we always end the show with, um, you know, what can we do to help you? What can we do? You know, aside from, hey, sending you leads of construction people we know, right? How can we help Martin? Yeah, sure. Well, so I, um, I don't have, I mean, as, as far as level set goes, I mean, look, we're, we're not explicitly hiring today, but it's not going to be very long until I'm hiring in the future. Uh, and that's just not in sales. I look at myself as, as um, I think like an owner and in our business, we need across the org and product and engineering and marketing and yeah. growth and sales. Um, we're a scaling org. So that's always good. And that's, I do these things, these interviews, um, or, or connect across the, the, the field leadership world because I don't know, I feel like you, you get out what you put into it. And the more stuff I do like this, um, the more our name gets out there, the more my name gets out there, um, the more people will be interested in joining the cause at level set or in the next chapter, uh, when I'm working on something else, um, I'll, you know, it'll, I'll, I'll be more attractive to people who want to work with me. Um, but how can you help? I mean, I just wanted to come and hang out with you, Richard, and hang out with Scott and talk with you for a little while. That, that's it. So let's do this again, maybe off the record with a, with a cocktail. And, uh, and we, can, no we can have a good time. If, if you're telling me you've been holding back <laughs> the last 45 minutes, I'm going to be really upset. So No, I, I no. They, unfortunately, there's only one version of me that you get. And this is yeah, it. So, but I, I do have, actually, I do have one more question. Um, from this experience, right? First of all, is, and I can't remember what you said at the beginning, is your team already dispersed and remote or did, were they traditionally coming into the office? Yeah. No, yeah, we, we have an inside sales team. So uh, we have, a, I mean, it's exactly so, what you would expect. We have the gong, we have the music playing, everybody's got their standing desk, so there's will you, dogs. I mean, we're like a startup like everybody else. And now everybody is distributed and, re and remote. But so does that, so let's say when, let's say, you know, July 1st, it turns back on maybe June 1st, you know, Maybe it's Friday if you're in certain states. Um, you know, do you think you'd be more open to hiring and onboarding a remote inside sales rep now that you've kind of realized I can do this? Even though I was forced into do it, would you be willing to do it? Or is it still like, no, we need that culture, man. We still got to have them come in every day. Yeah, so I, I look at an inside sales team and an inside sales culture as, as a privilege. Um, and I think that we're lucky to get to work in that type of environment. And we built that environment on purpose. So for the team that we built at level set, I'm not interested in hiring remote for our SMB sales team. I'd be open to it for a field sales rep because we expect them to be on the road and traveling anyway. And we do know how to manage remote employees. We do have remote employees that are not on the sales team. Um, and so it's, it's, not a, it's not an unfamiliar thing for us. Um, but I'd say that for, for our culture, I think that it's a, it's, um, you know, it's a privilege to have that type of culture and we should want to be in the office because of the energy, because of the osmosis and because of how, um, how quickly you can scale people up for the content that, that we're talking about with our business and lean rights. Um, I think that the inside sales culture lends well to that. Um, it does have its detriments. There are distractions there, you know, it can, ironically, we found that that productivity has gone up um, now that folks are remote <laughs> and it's because there's fewer distractions. Um, so we've toyed around as a leadership team talking about doing one day a week remote or um, trying just trying to incorporate some sort of remote work life um, into into our, our rhythm. But my my first foot forward would be to to um, to keep it as an inside sales team and require like I'm not going to go hire somebody in Iowa to join our sales team. And, and that's because, you know, don't take my word for it. You can go look at our Glassdoor profile. And we have really, really strong culture and really good, um, a really good experience for the people who work at Level Set. And that's because you really need that human connection. You need to be in the office to, to, to drink just, the Kool-Aid. So you, you just said you're willing to forego data and revenue just to have people in the office. You just said people are more productive, right? So aren't you going to at least spend some time diagnosing that a bit? And some of it could be new car stuff. Yeah. Some of it could be like, hey, you know what? That's, I need to that's what I think it is. Job, like, you know, I got it. But 
I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. No doubt. Yeah. And that's why we're open. I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out how to incorporate some of the remote work elements, but I, um, I think you said it right. I think it is a little bit of new car smell because we're even, you know, it's pe people get fatigued <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that, um, people we're starting to see it on our team, you know, the, the product productivity went up for the first four and I say up, you know, you're talking about connect rates went up a little bit. Activity rates went up a little bit. Who's to say it's because of remote or because uh, of some other thing that's happening. Right. Um, but we're definitely looking at it and it, I'm not going to ignore data when I have it. Um, but my, my intuition is that it is new car smell and that people will get fatigued and are, are going to want that human connection. Um, Cause so that's what our culture was built on. Yeah. Have you asked any of your employees, any of your remote reps, if we were going to employ this going forward, what would you want it to look like? Like if you could have a day off. Yeah, we actually ran. Yeah. Yeah, we did that. Last, so we do I do an AMA with the team every other week and we ran a, um, just a quick survey with the team just to see uh, until we got a flood. Right. Well, that's what I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, like that's what I wanted to make sure people got out of this is like, don't make this decision without involving the team, right? Don't yeah. say yes, don't say no, and certainly say, hey, if we wanted to do this, one, would you want it? Two, it's very different to say, hey, work from home every day versus, hey, you know what? You don't have to come in on Friday. Work from home on Friday, which all of a sudden sounds like you get a long weekend, right? Like, I think you got to have those honest conversations with your team now and let everybody be willing to sort of say, no, 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 I promise if I do it on Fridays, I'll, I'll still be productive. Like, then, you know, let them do it, right? So I think that's great. Cool. Well, Martin, yeah. this has been awesome. So thank you so much. It's good to catch up with you again. Um, and we really appreciate you being here. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, Richard. And let me know, um, you know what, how else I can help. Happy to, happy to support you guys. And I love what you're doing. Keep publishing content and you'll keep getting lucky. Thank you. We appreciate it. Catch you later, Martin. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.